As for me, I almost missed it. Almost, but not quite. I've been lying there for a couple hours. My eyes were tired. The day was warm, and I've been working hard the past few days and was tuckered. I must have been looking right at it, the barrel full, rifle barrel, a full minute before I realized. Only the fact that Kenyon was moving saved him. He was down by the water, probably hidden by some rocks. He was digging sand from the lower side of the boulder, preparing to wash it out. That rifleman was waiting for him to come up on the bank, where he had no doubt. Me, I didn't wait. Sliding my old Sharps breech loader up, I just throw a shot in that brush, right along that rifle barrel. There was a crash in the brush, and both me and Jim jumped for it. But the heavy brush and boulders got in the way, and by the time we got there, that fellow was gone. Nor could we make any anything from the tracks except they wore boots and was there for a white man. We tried to track him, though, but I found nothing until we slid down among some rocks, and there we found Kruger. Even scalped. No engine, Kenyon said, and he was right. That was plain as day to any old Indian fighter. We got a murderer in the outfit, I said. Maybe, Kenyon said doubtfully, but there could be someone else around, somebody we don't know about yet. After a pause, he said, We've got not got much gold yet. No one of us has, I agreed. But for one man, it's a healthy stick if he had it at all. Engines around, Kenyon said that night of fire. Today I was shot at. I've been afraid of that, Cobb agreed. We better watch ourselves. Josh Boone glanced over a cart. It ain't engines that scares me, he said. But if Ed Carp noticed, he paid no attention. For the next two days, everything went along fine. I worked with an eye open for trouble. And every now and then, again, I'd quit work and scout around to make sure nobody was closing in on me. On the bottom of the shaft, I snuck, sunk. I broke up the layers of bedrock where there were cracks and made a good cleanup. Even me, who had been doing well, couldn't believe how rich the time was. When I sacked up that night, I had more than I ever had in my life. More than I'd ever seen, in fact. Kenny met me on a great pond place on the creek bank. Let's go higher, I suggested, and sink a shaft together. We'll work faster, and the ground, this ground is rich enough for both of us. Ed Carp came into us. He looked from one to the other. I like to throw in with you boys, he said. I'm getting spooked. I don't like to go it alone. He looked at us, his face flushing. Maybe I lost my nerve. Why do you say that? I asked. I feel somebody scouting me all the time. Boone joined us just then, carrying his rifle in the hollow of his arm. What's this, everybody quitting so soon? If we're going to team up and work together, I said. We figure it'll be safer, less chance of engine, engine sneaking up on us. I think we should just get what we can and just move out while our luck holds. Josh Boone stared at me. You running the show now? I thought I was like the leader. He was, Kenan agreed. It wasn't any idea of leading that started Pike talking. He figures we'd do a lot better with working together on sheriffs than each working by himself. Oh, does he? He, do he does, does he? I don't see he's done so, so darn well. I got more than 4,000 in gold. If any one of you has over 1,000, I'll cook child this night. 4,000? They just stared. Jim was the one who said it, but he spat into the dust. What are we waiting for? I ain't got 500. That settled it, but it did not settle Josh Boone. He was sore because they had all listened to me now. Even Carp listened, although I was keeping an eye on Carp. He kept his gun close and his eyes busy, but mostly he was watching me. I saw that right off. We were edgy, all of us. Here we were, four men out in miles from, from anywhere or anybody, hid in the Black Hills, the Paha Sapa. In Lakota.
But we watched each other more than we watched for engines. German Kruger was gone, so our little world was lessened by one. Our total strength less than tw by 20%. Our loneliness increased by the missing mode faced by the fire at night. Somebody, either Carp, Boone, or some stranger had killed Kruger and had been on about to shoot Ken Jim Kenyon. Only we had no stranger tracks, nor even the tracks of any engine at the time. Our meat gave out, and Carp was the hunter. He didn't... He did not like it very much, and he hesitated. I was about to say something, which his personal courage would not let him say. My father, who had been a reading man in a few books he had, often quoted the Bible or saw the Psalms books, and he was one to speculate in one of those ways. I thought of him now and wondered whether what he would say of our situation. Since my father's death, I have had no books but, and read but poorly. It ain't, it, it ain't as if the idea wasn't there. Carp took his rifle and went out alone, and the rest of us went to work. It was hot, and the air was close. Jim paused once, leaning on a shovel. Feels like a storm coming, he said. And I did not think he meant only in the weather. Taking off my guns, I placed them on a flat rock close to hand while I worked. Folks who never packed pistols can't imagine how heavy they are. Pretty soon, Josh Boone got out of the hole and traded places with the Kenyon. Jim, he put down his rifle and went to work. All of a sudden, and why I turned, I do not know. I turned sharp around, and there was Ed Carp standing on the bank with his rifle in his hands. He looked around down at Boone and I would have sworn he was about to shoot him. Boone, he was on his feet, his own rifle ready, and what would have happened next was anybody's guess. When suddenly an arrow smacked into a tree within inches of Carp's head, and he yelled, Engines! and ducked for cover. He took shelter behind the bank while Jim and Boone then made it to the fort. Me, I squatted down in the hole where I was, and when engines rushed up, I opened with both Colts. Carp? had turned the fire on them. And what he or the others did, I do not know. But I dropped four men and a horse. Then I caught my rifle, but they were gone, leaving behind them several horses and some engines. A couple of them started to crawl away, and we let them go. Boone went out to gather what guns he had could find, and catch up what the horses were bringing in. Whilst he was collecting them, I saw him throw something in the bushes. At the time, I saw nothing, thought nothing of it. My guns were loaded. I watched the boys come together again. Nobody had more than a scratch. We'd been ready as much as for other men, as for, much for each other as for them, but everybody was out ready to shoot as when they showed up. And of course, we had our fort such as it was. Lucky. Boone said, mighty lucky. He'll be back, Kenny said with pride grimly. Our scalps are worth more than we've shown ourselves warriors. Nobody knew better than what a break that we had than I. If the Indians had come with us easy, like slipping up and opening fire from cover, we'd have had small chance. The Indians have bad leaders as well as white men, and this one had been too confident, too eager. Young Braves, no doubt, reckless and anxious to count coop on a white man. And wanting loot, too, our guns and horses. But nobody needed to tell anybody what stopped them. Josh Boone was staring at me again. You handle them coats, coats like a man who knows how, how to use them. Why do you figure he carries them? I knew he was handy. Kenny was smiling with some secret pleasure. Carp had a wry amusement in his eyes. And I think I nearly got into a shooting scrape with you. This does it, Kenyon said. Now we'll have to go. Boone started to object, then said nothing. We slept cold that night, staring away from the fire and close to our horses. If they stole our horses and we those we, we had of our, theirs, we'd never get out of there alive. It was far too... 
It was too far to anywhere safe. We stopped two at a time, not taking a chance of having one man awake because we didn't know who the murderer was. At daybreak, we slipped away from camp. We covered our holes, hiding our tools, and what gear we did not want to carry. We kept one pan for taking samples downstream, and then we took off. What the others were thinking, I have no idea, but as for me, I was worried. One of us was a murderer, and was, we wanted all of our gold. It wasn't enough that we had to watch our engines, but one among us as well. We hadn't gone three miles before Cannon, who was in the lead, threw up a hand. Engines, he said hoarsely. Must be 30 or 40 of them. That about, about faced us, you can bet. We turned back up creek, riding fast, and then turned off in the woods. We hadn't gone far before we heard them again, only this time it was another bunch already spread out in the woods. A gun thundered somewhere about ahead of us, then an arrow whistled by my head, and I swung my horse. I took a quick shot with the sharps and saw an Indian fall. Then I was riding hell for leather and trying to load whilst we ran. There was a yell behind us and Carp's horse stumbled, throwing Ed to the ground. He lit running just a couple of Indians closed in on him. Monk swung a, a tomahawk high and I shot it without aiming, then sharp, shoved the sharps into the boot and went for a six shooter. Boone and Kenyon both fired and Ed came running. He still had his rifle and saddlebags. No used to run, Jim yelled. Too many of them. We got to stand. There were rocks ahead, not far from our old fort, and we hit them running. My horse ran on, but I was sh soon shooting as, I, as soon as I hit the ground, and Jim beside, Kenny beside me. Boone and Carp found good places, but they also opened fire. The attack broke off as quick as it began. Carp had a bullet scratched along the skull and a burn on his shoulder. You boys saved me, he seemed amazed. He surely did. Our horses were still with us. Mine had run on and then circled back to be with me or with what the horses he knew. I did not know much. Which? We had our horses and what we had Indians all around us and no help nearer than three or four hundred miles. At least none that we knew of. If they wipe us out, Boone commented, nobody will ever know what happened to us. We wouldn't be the first, Kenyon said. I found a skull and part of a spine in the ribcage back yonder when I was hunting gold. The bones had a gold pan along with them. We sat there waiting for the next attack, inspecting little when I heard that scream. It was close by, and on all the confusion, I hadn't heard thought of it. Look, I said, if we can hold on till dark, I think we can get out of this. They looked at me waiting, but nobody said anything. Right at the moment, nobody thought of much of his chances. If we can send them off till dark, we'd slip away upstream in the cave I found. They'll think we left the country. What about the horses? Kenyon asked. I have to leave them, I said, although it went hard to leave my Tennessee horse. Maybe there's another entrance, Jim suggested. Where there's one cave, there's sometimes others. We sat tight and let the sun do its work. It was almighty hot, but we had to put up with it, for there was no more than the edging of shade for near some of the boulders. Engines tried a few shots, and so did we, more to let them know that we were still alive and ready with hope of hitting anything. Boom was lying beside me and kept his, turning his head to stare at all over the rocks. Think we'll make it? He asked me. All the big-headedness seemed to have gone out of them. I sure like to save my pelt. They came on then. They came on a wave from three sides, riding low on their horses, and again it was my Model 48 that stopped them. Not that I killed anybody, but I rained bullets around them and just burned a couple. And they couldn't understand that rapid fire. They knew about guns, but they some they had some themselves, but they'd never run against any repeating weapons. The last engine was riding away when he turned sharp in the saddle and let go with a shot that winged Josh Boone. It hit him high and hard, and he went down. 
leaving the shooting to Carpenter's Kenyon, I went back. I went to Boone. His face was all twisted with pain. But when I went to undo the laces on his buckskin shirt, he jerked away, his eyes wild and crazy. No, leave me. Let me alone. Don't bother with me. Don't be a fool, Josh. You've been hit hard. You get treated or you'll die soon. Sure. He was sullen. I better die then. You go off. I'll fix my, myself. Something in his voice stopped me as I started to turn away. Slamming him back on the floor, on the ground, in no gentle way. I ripped open the rawhide cores and peeled back his hunting shirt. There was a nasty moon there. All right, that shattered his collarbone and left him bleeding most awful bad, but that wasn't all. There was another wound that was on top of his shoulder, which was all festering and sure. When I saw that, I stopped. He stared at me, his mouth drawn and no hard line. His eyes ugly, yet there was something else too. There was shame as well as fear. There was only one time he could have gotten that wound. Like when a bullet comes along a man's rifle and cuts the meat off his shoulder. It had been Josh Boone and not Ed Carp who tried to kill Jim Kenyon, and therefore it had been Boone who killed old German Kruger. He stared at me and said no word while I washed out the wound and picked away bone fragments and put it the best shape I could manage. I folded an old bandana to stop the bleeding, but bound it tight in place. By the time I finished, it was fetching close to dusk and the engines had let up on their shooting. Kenyon moved desk right, and there was another hole in that cave, just a big crack, like but big enough to get a horse inside, and even a horse as big as my Tennessee. Once they were inside, we pulled a couple of pieces of old, old log into the gap, and we bedded down to wait it out. Oh, comma, they come a-hunting all right. We could hear them looking for us. We kept quiet, and after a while, they gave up and lured away. We sat it down for three days in that cave, and then Jim slipped out to scout around. They were gone, thinking they, we'd gotten away, and we slipped out, mounted up, and headed back for the settlements. We had building in sight, and we knew we were safe. I pulled up and turned to face them. Josh, I said. German left a widow behind. She's up at the settlement waiting for him. With German dead, she will be hard to put to live. I figured he might like to contribute, Josh. He sat his horse looking at me, and he, I knew he was left-handed as well as right. He had a gun, a handgun I'd seen him pick out of the bushes after he'd taken off the dead engine. He looked at me, and I looked at him. I put no hand to a gun, and I knew there was no need. You just tossed me your poke, Josh, I told him. His eyes were all mean-like, and he tossed me the poke. Now the other one. Ed Carp and Jim, they just sat watching, and Ed couldn't seem to figure it out. Ed Kenyon, and Kenyon knew, although how long he'd known, I couldn't guess. Josh Boone waited holding off as long as he could, but then he tossed me the other poke. Pocketing the pokes, I then took a couple of nuggets and from dust from my own poke. There's maybe a hundred dollars here, I said. It's riding money, a loan from me to you. I'll owe you for that, he said. I always pay my debts. I'll see no man beggar beggared with a broken arm, I said, but that's what I named it. Riding money, now you ride. We sat there watching as he, while he rode away, back square to us. One arm hitched kind of high. He rode like that right out of time because we never saw him again. Well, Jim said after a bit, if Wayne came in here, let's ride in. I'm going to wet my whistle. We started riding and nobody said anything more.